Welcome to House of Truth Fellowship. We are a group of people in Tucson, Arizona who have been saved by Jesus Christ and have a desire to follow Him. Our vision as a church is to glorify God through our lives that have been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our mission is to communicate and preach the unchanging truth of the person and work of Jesus Christ in a way that everyone in our city can comprehend. The way we accomplish this is by gathering in settings both large and small to preach, pray, study the Bible, and love people. Our desire is to continually equip people to bring glory to God and the light of Jesus into their respective communities, however diverse they may be. that you would continue to keep our hearts steady, Father, and our, our vision steady on you, and that you would remind us, Lord, through the study that it's all about you, and <clears throat> help us just to continue to, uh, Lord, keep our our focus, Lord, and uh, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. 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 So you guys ready for Zechariah? Yeah. All right, Zechariah 3, <clears throat> my voice is all messed up, so... If I start coughing really hard towards you guys, just going to let you know now. Yeah. Yes. Just joking. I won't. <clears throat> I'll be here in 10 minutes. Just say. <laughs> so we'll be here in 10 minutes. What? Okay. Huh? Did you hear her? What? She said Tyler's going to be here in 10 minutes. Oh, just, just so you know. We're going to be done in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. What are we, what chapter are we in? Chapter 3. Zachariah chapter 3. I think next week, yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> you can tell me still. We might do, yeah. I don't know how we're going to do the rest of the chapters. We might do a chapter at a time, and then maybe there will be a week where we'll just knock out two chapters. Because they're basically in the same context, so it's easy to put that in our <clears throat> outline format. So... How about, for context's sake, let's go ahead and read uh, all of chapter 3, and then we'll just go ahead and start with it. But, uh, does any, any volunteers want to read? Sure, I'll, I'll read. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy <coughs> garments from him. And to him he says, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. The, then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, <laughs> saying, there, there was a title there, and I almost read that, saying, thus says the Lord God, Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my command, then you shall also judge my house, and likewise have char charge of my courts. And I will give you places to walk among these who stand here. Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companion who sit before you. For they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon the stone are seven eyes. 
Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. And that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming. <clears throat> that is it. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so you guys remember what Zachariah's name means? What does his name mean? We ask every week. Every week. Huh? I said, do you? <laughs> do I? Do you ask every week? No. Yes. Yes. For the last week. Have I ever had to ago. answer before? I'm old. I don't remember. <laughs> I said I used to know. I forgot. It, well, his name pretty much means uh, Jehovah remembers. So, God remembers. Jehovah remembers. And remember, if you count the minor prophets, he's the 11th uh, of the 12 minor prophets in your Old Testament. So, he's going to be one of the last. In fact, he's one of the three post-exilic prophets, which means uh, they're the ones that pretty much came out of Babylon, uh, out of the captives, you know. And their prophesying, their ministry pretty much happened after Babylon. So, there's usually just three of those guys, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And it's kind of... Um, in order for us too, at the last, the last minor prophet. It's pretty cool how the Bible puts it like that, in chronological order. But um, he is a contemporary with Haggai. So remember, we're going over Haggai, the prophet. Picture that prophet hanging out with Zechariah. So that's kind of how it was. They're they're together. They're friends, and they had come back with uh, Zerubbabel. Remember, there was that first wave of captives that came out of Babylon into Jerusalem to rebuild the temple for the Lord. And so he's a part of that whole uh, construction and the, the people. And, um, Ezra says that this first wave, about 50,000 people came back. Uh, so you can picture 50,000 people, Zerubbabel, who is the high priest, and then there's going to be Joshua, which we'll, we already, we're going to talk about. Um, but Zechariah, and there's Haggai, so there's a group of prophets just hanging out um, that we know of is just Zechariah and Haggai and Malachi. But anyways, um, so Zechariah was given eight prophetic visions, and all these visions happened in one single <coughs> night, which is crazy. Imagine going to sleep and just like saying, whoosh, like one movie scene, and then all of a sudden another scene, and another scene, and another scene, and... It's just, it's, a, it's pretty intense. So he begins to write about the vision that he saw, and, and this is uh, eight visions. <clears throat> Chapter one um, had two night visions. So the first was the man riding on the red horse that we talked about, and that spoke of God's comfort for Israel as, a, as well as their prosperity to Israel. And uh, Second vision involved the four horns and the four craftsmen, if you guys remember that. Uh, this spoke of God's judgment against the nations that came against Israel. And so we, we saw all that in chapter 2. And then the third night vision involved the man with the measuring line. You guys remember, he's going out and Zechariah's like, Hey, excuse me, where are you going? <laughs> so, well, I'm going to go measure Israel, pretty much, or Jerusalem. I'm going to measure the gates. I'm going to measure this. And uh, so we talked about that. Well, tonight we're going to talk about the fourth night vision, which is pretty much all of chapter 3. Uh, but this involves Joshua the high priest. He was mentioned in Haggai chapter 1, and he came from, uh, like I said, he came with everybody else during that first wave of captives that came out of Babylon. Uh, but tonight I just kind of want to look at four things, just keep it very simple. It's only ten verses, and uh, I figure if we can just contain it, it's worth it. If you can understand it, it was a good, it's good. You want to come to a study that you can understand. So uh, let's just look at four things here. The first is this fourth night vision. It actually involves standing before good and evil. Look at verse 1 again. It says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand, to oppose him. So 
after the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity, Joshua, he's one of the, the high priests, pretty much, um, since there was pretty much none left. You guys, out of 70 years, they all kind of dwindled down, and there's really uh, not much of an option. But he's one of the guys that qualifies, so he's considered a high priest. Um, so here, Joshua is standing before good and evil, right? There's before Satan himself and before the angel of the Lord or, or, or God himself, right? Or the Messiah, I guess you can say, which is, it's like Jesus in the Old Testament. Um, but Satan, he's bringing those accusations against him, against Joshua. And, and get the picture here, too. Um, look at verse 2. It says, And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? And so the Lord asked that question to Satan himself. But here's Joshua just caught in the middle of the, the, the crossfire, right? And it's, it's, uh, it just, it's interesting. It's almost like that court scene, right? You've got Satan there bringing his accusations. You've got the Lord sitting on the throne. And uh, so it's a pretty interesting little picture here. But Satan is coming to God, and he's accusing Joshua of certain things. And what is he accusing him of? Well, he's pretty much saying Joshua is filthy, Joshua is dirty, Joshua is unworthy, and he's not worthy to be the high priest in Jerusalem. Satan's against Joshua. And this is crazy. If you befriend Satan, he's one of those guys who will turn on you. You guys ever had a friend like that? I don't like it. It's just started. Okay. I don't know what I'm going to do because you're really tall. Goodbye. Okay, <laughs> <bye. laughs> just like, guess you're not as excited to see me. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Joshua, right? He's just caught, caught in between um, Satan and the Lord and, and uh, and Satan's coming against Joshua, and he's saying, hey, here's the accusation they have against Josh. He's filthy, he's dirty, he's not worthy to be in your presence. In fact, he's not worthy to even have this position that you're giving him. And uh, so, and that's uh, the position of being a high priest, right? So this is interesting to me because in <clears throat> Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, we see Satan is what? He's, he's constantly, day and night, at the throne of God, and he's accusing the brethren, the Bible says. And it's it's amazing. So he's constantly there, and he's like, that Joshua, he's dirty, he's filthy, he's not worthy. He's not worthy to come into your presence. And then there's Jesus who reminds him of what he did for, for you and I as the church, right? That we are worthy not because of us. We're worthy because of Jesus. And, and I can just picture him showing his scars and, you know, the, the wounds that he went through just for you and I, who abide in him daily, uh, which is a good thing. But, uh, so we don't stand, obviously, in our own righteousness, right? We stand in whose righteousness? God. Right. And the moment you try to stand in your righteousness, can you actually do it? You will be humbled. Yeah, you will be humbled. You'll find out sooner or later that you can't achieve anything before the Lord. Um, that is good. Yeah, it's like that t-shirt that says, There is a God, you are not Him. <laughs> mm. Yeah, right? So stop trying yeah. to be His, do His job. But here, here we see this war, right? And it's a battle between good and evil... And Joshua, he's stuck in the middle. Zechariah is just, he's watching all this in a vision as he lay there at night. And he's just seeing this all happen. And, um, and that just reminds me, too, that we're in a spiritual battle. And a, a lot of times we don't remember that. We, we get on with our daily schedule. And we go about our day. And we, we know about it when, we, when the you know, subject comes up. But it's something that we got to remember constantly. <clears throat> it's really going to help us out, too, in our battle, but um, it's a real battle. It's a real spiritual battle. And Zechariah, he had seen it himself as they battled it out uh, for Joshua the high priest, right? Um, 
so so too it is with us though so we saw Zechariah we saw the vision we saw Joshua we've seen the accusation we see Satan we see the Lord we see what righteousness is but with you and I there's a battle going on for our souls there's a battle going on for our minds that we would either forfeit and give worship to the enemy or forfeit and give worship to the Lord right either way you're gonna give give worship you're a worshiper naturally whether it's onto the Lord or whether it's onto Satan right and uh, so it's one thing to to just realize that the more you realize the Word of God it's gonna help us out like amazingly so here as the accuser he stands he, he's pouring he's pointing at you and I and he's accusing you and I of the things that we've done wrong. Once you do something wrong, he's like, aha, look, Lord, did you see that? And that's what I was getting at earlier, too. Like, I remember having friends uh, in elementary school, and uh, I was a gangster kid, right? So, like, there's no such thing as telling on me. <laughs> you can tell on others, but not me. And uh, I had friends where I'd go and do so. I used to steal a lot. So uh, there'd be like a boom box in the classroom and like after school I'd jump through the window and take it and, and then all of a sudden the teacher comes out and my little friend's all, Josh took it, he's over there hiding. I was all, really? <laughs> so that always reminded me though of Satan. That's him. He's the he's one of those guys who's always telling on you. He's never gonna be your friend. He'll always deceive you and be like, yeah, he'll encourage you. He'll, he'll root you on to do wrong. And then once you do it, he's all, Lord, look, dog, ah, to tell. Right, look at him, look, he's doing it. And he rubs it in your face, pretty much. But praise the Lord, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. His name is Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the righteous one. So we got to um, understand as a believer in Christ, okay, you, you first came to Christ because you repented, right? You, you had forgiveness in Christ Jesus. And then you understood your position in Christ Jesus that, wow, my position is awesome. <laughs> I'm in a war and I'm given everything I need to win. I'm not given what I need to go and, you know, God didn't give us a stick and say, okay, go, go to war. He gave you, like, updated technology to an enemy that has no updated technology, right? Yeah. That's pretty much it. You, you go in there, you do the job, you just, everything's coming from the Lord. So you understand you have the Holy Spirit, you understand it's all about Jesus, you understand, like, life is amazing, Right? And you give worship to the Lord. So once you got that forgiveness, that you understand your position, then you begin to understand your calling in life. God begins to say, okay, you're, you're done with yourself. You understand it's not about you. It's all about me. Now let's move on. And you begin to understand that calling that God has in your life. And it becomes evident. It just becomes real. And you're like, wow, this is where I got to go. And you begin to, you're there either already <clears throat> or it's just one of those things where um, you're there, but you're not there, right? With you guys, probably. You're, you're probably living in India right now, and you don't even know <laughs> it. You're still here in Tucson. But <clears throat> it's, it's, just, it's amazing how God can do that with calling. Um, so when he calls you, uh, then you keep going on from calling. You understand your calling. You understand that it's the Lord working in through your life, and, and you're beginning to produce that worship from your life because you're in the place of where God has you, right? You're walking in His will. And it just, it's a blessing. But during that whole process of being a believer, one of the blessings is understanding that we have an advocate with the Father. And that is Jesus Christ. So the one who saved you, the one who forgave you, is the one who's still fighting for you. It wasn't just a one-time deal as far as your salvation. <clears throat> it's an it's a everyday thing. That he's constantly, the Bible says that he's constantly at the throne of God. He's constantly um, interceding for you and I. Mm. He's praying for you and I. You guys remember how he was praying constantly for Peter? And, and he's like, Peter, you know, Satan's asked that he could take you out pretty much. And 
I've asked, and he, you can just see that, that heart that he had. He was just constantly battling it out for him in prayer. Uh, you know, it's just so cool that that's the exact same thing that he's doing for you and I, the creator of the universe, right? You look up at the stars, the moon, the sun, the sky, the mountains, anything, and you're like, man, and where's that creator right now? What is he doing? Well, he's praying for you and I. Hmm. It's, I don't understand it. You're God. Why would you? That It's his heart. And what, as a, a parent, right, we know and, and for you guys, you guys know as well, for those who are not saved in your family, you're constantly praying for them. You're constantly just in, in, in sometimes in agony for them. Whether it be for good or for bad or whatever it might be, you're, you're praying constantly that they just know Christ and love the Lord and come in His presence, right? And one day we all will as believers, right? It's coming up very soon. I am confident uh, that it can happen even tonight. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> that would have been cool. Um, how was your last minute on earth? God, you should see it. <laughs> Check it out. God synced with me. Um, but yeah, so we, we realize, yes, we're dirty. Yes, we are on, we're unfit for the kingdom of God, right? We're not worthy, we're dirty, we're filthy, we're nasty. Um, but <clears throat> it was Christ Jesus who washed us, who redeemed us, from our sins that were disgusting, they're as scarlet, right? And he, he washed us as white as snow. And uh, it, it's just a beautiful picture, but it's a beautiful position that God has given us <clears throat> in Christ Jesus. So First um, John 1, 9, we realize we've been cleansed as believers. And our sin is no more, right? It's been thrown in that sea of forgetfulness. It's, it's gone. It's not coming back again. Sure, there's consequences that may come back, but that sin that, that, that kept you from your relationship with God, God is definitely gone. It's no more. Which means when you're in heaven and you're like, hey, Lord, you know that one sin? I, uh... <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> what are you talking about? You got you know I did this and oh, you did I don't know I don't know I would know right it's one of those things where it's it's not coming back again so when you see Satan there he's like ah Lord look God's all, it's been done it's been finished right it's boom you're you're forgiven so you may not always see that you're in a spiritual warfare you may not always remember that you're in a spiritual warfare. Uh, but it's a, it's very real. I just want to throw that out there as we're going through the verse 2. It just stood out to me that, like, man, how many of us really realize that we are in a spiritual warfare? Right? Yeah? Amen. Yeah? Good. Go with me on Tuesday night to play pool, and you'll see it. Oh, I see it every day. Yeah. Thank you. you know, I thought, it was, I thought it was interesting that uh, he used the word filthy there, you know? Joshua was filthy. Satan accused him of being filthy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the word filthy is the same word they used in uh, Isaiah 64, 6, where it talks about our righteousnesses are as filthy rags unto God. Yeah. You know, so yeah, that's is. kind of the picture he's painting there. Yeah. Well, I, guess I, didn't. I saw that verse today. I thought I'd put it on here, didn't I? It's good. But yeah, we're in a spiritual warfare. And uh, we got Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. It's am amazing to give scripture like this to a non-believer and say, Hey, if you become a Christian, you're going to be fighting against these things every single day. Right? I'd be like, uh, I don't want to be a Christian. <laughs> well, you're not the really one the fighting, though. You're kind of just riding in with the Lord, you know, just like you're going to in the future. You know, we're going to be riding with the Lord on horses, but he's doing all the work. He's conquering. So right now, practically, you're just riding along. And you, obviously, the battle belongs to the Lord. So why does he say you're in a spiritual? Why would you need to know? Because... You need to know. Uh, how are you writing? What are you writing? I don't know. What's your position? What side are you on? So the good news is that 2 Corinthians 10.4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. You know, there's those strongholds that we see in our life, but God has given us access to, like, nuclear warfare, right, spiritually. And you can just go in there and be like, you know what? You're not big. Boom! It's all about Jesus and what He can do in our lives. So you and I have all the <clears throat> that we need uh, for this battle. Everything. God has prepared us for it as believers. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 2 Peter 1, um, he has given us all things to, that pertains to life and God, godliness, um, and then he goes on from there. Uh, Romans 8, 37 says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You know, it's. do you guys understand that position that we have yet? It's pretty neat, right? So even if Satan himself is coming against you, which... That's pretty awesome to me. If I knew that Satan himself is coming against me and he knows my name, I'd be like, what's up? What's up? I reach popular status. Yes. Yeah. God is here. God strike you down. Yeah. So what? Excuse me. Go ahead. Get him. <laughs> yeah. So the battle, it's real. And you and I, we have to understand, we have everything that we need, right? We're... We're, we're set. We're prepared. Mm -hmm. Even though you haven't tested those weapons out yet, maybe, you don't necessarily need to because it's all Jesus. As long as you have Jesus and you're abiding in Him, and let's just get real. Every single day, right? You wake up, just be in prayer. Get in the Word of God. Spend that alone time with the Lord. Hear from the Lord. And, and then as you go throughout the day, continue staying in prayer, right? You go to work. Oh, this and this is happening. Pray, right? That's the spiritual battle I'm talking about. Um, at work, I hear people say, "Oh, the the Christians here, and oh, everybody just oh, uh, they know when I'm around." And it's just weird. It's it's crazy because you can. It's almost like they they just know spiritually speaking. They know there's a threat that's by, and so it comes out verbally in in, in any way. Just ah, here it comes, you know. And I praise the Lord because it's been giving me open doors. I use whatever they're, um, they usually have this like nervousness, you know, that comes out. And uh, it's good. God is so good. Um, but yeah. <clears throat> you guys have anything to say about verse 1 or verse 2? So, verse 2, once again, though, really quick. The Messiah is telling Satan. The Lord rebuke you, right? So here you have Jesus saying, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. And I don't believe we should talk with Satan, just to throw that out there. Um, I don't see it in the Bible. I see it a lot in churches and different places and different people. Are they just like, it's a normal thing to them. It's not like it's their first conversation with Satan. It's like a daily thing where you're, you're like, let's pray, man. And okay. Well, Satan, you just, what were you praying to? You know? Why would you pray to Satan? I don't understand. Don't, I don't want to talk to him. Man, I, I don't want to do anything with him or around him. At all. I don't. I really, I don't. Um, but people love it. It's a, scary, it's a scary thing. Have you guys been around people like that? Uh -huh. They just... <laughs> I haven't actually been, but I mean, I've heard yeah, it. I've just... seen it and, like, I've yeah. never... I mean, you think that's like taking on the thing of we're more powerful, so yeah. we're talking yeah. smack to Satan. Like, right. Is, that, is like, that where that comes from? Well, he's a tempter. I mean, you said you're talking with him. I, I talked to him when I was a kid, but it was I was trying to get him saved. I remember I... <laughs> <laughs> he preached the gospel to Satan? Um, I was probably, I think I was five or six, and my brother, who is now an atheist, um... He and I were in our upstairs, and I'm just like preaching the gospel at the floor, and my brother's on the ground, and he's banging on the ground, and he's like, are you listening? Do you hear this? Wow. And I was like, you need to repent and turn to Jesus. <laughs> obviously. That's awesome. Well, obviously I learned the error of that. That's so funny. But, 
Haven't had a conversation since. Our relationship has been a little strained. Good. Good job. Good job. Good job. Yeah. Good job. Well, I've been around people where it's kind of scary. Like, they'll go on full on conversation. Like, I don't even know you how they can. power do that. here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right to be here. Get out of here. And, like, I understand as a believer, we have position in Christ that's perfect. It's like, you have. You have all things in Christ Jesus. I understand that. But, I don't know. I don't want to stay too long on it. But you guys get the idea. For well, me see, personally, it's weird. Um, if you want to talk to Satan, it's up to you guys. But I would prefer you not. The only person we see in Scripture talk to Satan is Christ. Yeah. yeah. We don't see the apostles. We don't see any prophets. We don't see no anyone way. talk yeah. to Satan except for God. Right. When Job was tempted... It was it was Jesus and it was Satan talking. When yeah. we see the apostles, when we see Christ uh, send the the demons <coughs> to the swine, right? He, he was it was always Christ. It was never us. Yeah. So why start now? Yeah. 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 God's all man. You could have been spending time with me right now, and you're choosing to spend time. Okay. All right. I just got one thing because I know you don't want to. We know that. Like the Lord here, you know, is going against Satan, you know, because he always does. He's back and forth with him, okay? Now, uh, uh, Luke ten nine says that, you know, he's given us power over all the enemy. So now when it comes to that, is it okay to rebuke Satan in Jesus' name or just to say, okay, or whatever little minion is running around, you know, or just to say, the Lord rebuke you? I, I, is it right both ways or wrong one way or what is it is it you know the biblical way that we see is the lord rebuke you look mm -hmm. at jude uh, the michael the archangel look at yeah. uh, another angel not even a human mm -hmm. yeah saying and he is like the top dog of all of them that we know yeah and and he even said he doesn't say like i'm gonna get you later on you're gonna get changed let me remind you let me mm -hmm. the lord rebuke you jesus the Lord rebuke you. Yeah, Satan isn't is it uh, omnipresent. Right. Or he can't be everywhere at the same time. So, you right. know, it's, it's not like it's him. Maybe it's him, you know? But yeah. it's not like it's Satan that's, like, yeah. standing next to us and being like... Yeah, it's unlike if it were... It's one of his, right. it's, it's one of his minions, right. but, you know, Satan's got the Antichrist and everything. He's not over here. Right. But, you know... He does have one third of the angels, which is quite a few. Yeah. So, you know, they're the ones that are around us, but still, right. you know. Yeah. I, I think that the best place to be as a believer in Christ Jesus is being in Christ Jesus. An understanding in Christ Jesus means it's not about us. So our words are not going to come back out like, you know. Yeah any powerful. It's always going to be God's word that's going to come out powerful, right? That's going to cut to the heart and even the enemy's going to get cut to the heart because of God's word. Mm -hmm. Not our words. And there's nothing special about us. And so it's just a, just one of those things, just let the Lord do it. And it's, it, I think it's a good lesson to look at in verse 2, where it's not about us. So A good example, real <laughs> quick, yeah, like you see the seven sons of Sceva, <laughs> and you see like the fact that those men, they tried to rebuke the demons without Christ. Mm -hmm. And they mocked him. And they scared him out naked, you know. Yeah. And it was because they didn't know Christ. And they said, well, we know Paul. You know, we know this Jesus. So it's the fact of knowing Christ. It, that's what matters. You, you walk into a room, and if there's a demon around in that room, I mean, he's going to be terrified. Not of you, but of the living God that's inside of you. Right. You know, so when you walk in, you shouldn't even have to say rebuke you because Christ is... If if he's for us, yeah. he's against us. You know, like yeah. it's not even our work. Right. So you walk in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're more victorious. Obviously, you're more than a conqueror. Oh. The Bible says. So yeah, that's that is your position. You walk in, they got nothing, nothing on you because you you dwell with Christ, and that's kind of why I threw that out there. Um, just through quickly practicalizing it is just spend time with the Lord. You know, throughout the day. And as long as you're spending time with the Lord, you're safe, man. But there's those drifters that can drift for years and years and years. And they love church still. They love God still. But they just don't 
they don't have that that real constant relationship with the Lord, where they're not hearing from God anymore. Their their ears have been shut because they they just been gone for so long. They forgot the voice of God. You know, have you guys ever been in, in a like a marketplace or somewhere and you can you're not even looking at the person that you're looking for, but you can hear them and they're one voice out of all the voices that are going on you're you can naturally just boom that's them bam and you're you go and find them but and that's just and science can even tell you that but it's the same thing spiritually with the lord the more you hang out with the lord you can just you hear his voice you know that that's the lord it's not something every day we got to be like wow well, let's test that out lord come on i don't think that <laughs> obviously we know the the characteristics of god we know his word and so when he speaks, we know it's from the Lord. Obviously, if it's something out there, you definitely got to study it to make sure it's from the Lord. But we know. I know. The Lord speaks to me through his word. It's totally through his word. And it's in context. It's, it, it hits the context of my heart at the time. So I know. So it's just one of those things. Spending time with the Lord helps a lot. Um, and you don't have to worry about the dangers of the enemy. But... Uh, for those who have drifted for years and years from the Lord, I, I would, hey, I would be scared. <laughs> I don't know your position, that's why. Why are you drifting? Why, where is the conviction? What's been keeping you so long from the Lord? Well, it's kind of like what you said um, earlier, the example that you gave when you said, when you're trying to share to a non-believer, and, and they go, whoa, I, I want that job. Yeah. But then in essence, I mean, haven't you ever like been compelled or, or shared with a non-believer, but you are then on that side when you're not fighting against them, you're with them. Right. You know, I, I mean, which would you rather be? Right. And I mean, I have had people tell me, well, I'm afraid to be on the other side. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that's like almost like you don't know, but you are saying that you know you're succumbing to that. Wow, you know yeah. you're in some kind of not good stuff, and yet you're, you're afraid. Right. You're, you're held in that by fear. Right. And, and you know, the, the only other thing I was going to say is that I think the closer that I get to the Lord in, in terms of that kind of spiritual thing, because I kind of seem to kind of see that, like almost like materially... The Lord takes that fear away from me, and that's where I mess up. When I when I give into that fear, that's yeah. usually when I come out and not right. let the Lord be that right. do what He's going to do in that situation. It's all of us when we do that. When we choose not to walk in His ways, it's horrible. It's a it's a battle that definitely goes on in all of us. In fact, yesterday. Um, that's kind of like what the Lord was showing me is the world right at work. They're, they're coming up to me and they, they want to get to know me and build that relationship with me. But I'm not going to just, oh, how you doing, good friends? Come here. Ah. I'm not going to open up to them. And so they, they come up to me, though, and open up. And I don't even know them. They're Like this one girl yesterday, like, she's like, okay, so this is what's going on in my life right now. Blah, 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 right? And, but she's saying, I am in sin, and I am loving it, and I am causing a mess out of my sin, basically. Just Facebook in real life. Yeah. 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 And so I, I shot her down, obviously. Like, I'm not going to be like, oh, yay for you. She's looking for that applause. Like, look at me. And I, give me the popularity because of what I just slept with this guy over and uh, so I shot her down. I was like, obviously you're in sin, and you need Jesus. You're not in the right place. And there's a lot of things you need to be worried about in the real life because there's diseases, there's this. There's, I just went at it with that girl. I was like, you're in sin, and this is causing a mountain, just like a snowball effect. And you're, you're ruining the, not only your life, but you're choosing to ruin the other person's life and your family and everybody around you. And, and, and this person just left. They, could, they didn't want to talk to me anymore. And I was just thinking, that's that's awesome. Are you, do you are you? I was mad because I was like, are you seriously thinking you're gonna just come up to me, a, a Christian, you know, and just say, look at my sin and, and just watch me, just say, oh, yay for you, woo! And then I just realized there's a lot of people that do that. 
There's well, a lot of people that are afraid to stand up for the Lord. Your your mom and I were talking about that on Sunday, how um, it, it's almost like that's kind of the, and oh, we're older, so I mean, maybe it's that thing too of we're older and we see a different generation. It is such the shock and awe, you know, mm -hmm. that generation, there's no boundaries, and it's almost yeah. like it's a contest. You don't it's even true. know all the time if what people are saying or projecting about themselves is even true, because it's so in to be off the chart mm -hmm. in anything in your life, you know? Mm -hmm. But, you know, what your mom and I were saying is that even even <coughs> just being the way we were raised, I think, help me out here, Spoon, to, <laughs> to just talk to somebody honestly, you know, and, and it's hard to just find people that will just be honest. Yeah. You know, if you really want to sit down and talk to me about what's going on, I'll hear you. But you can't have guidelines on, like you say, how I'm going to respond. Because yeah. that's, you know, that's how I used to feel at my other job where I kind of felt like all day people would come to my desk and go, and, da -da -da -da, and then right. I'd be like, you know, and at first I didn't say anything, Josh. I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to lose my job, something yeah. bad's going to happen. And then I, I was like, no, there's no way. And I kind of think that they were doing it, even though they didn't want to, I think something was drawing them to say, what do you think about that? Right. And even if they didn't like the response, it, you know. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Let's say you choose to stay quiet. In a new surrounding, that's all of us. All of us have the. It's like our flesh. We just want to be accepted, right? We want to be the trustworthy person, or whatever. We yes, I'll listen. What you're saying is, you can trust me with this conversation, right? I'm a trustworthy person. I'm an honest person. I'll, I'm a good friend, is what you're saying. So, you want that, right? Naturally, but you can't have it. We're not in heaven yet. We got to get uncomfortable with this world. We gotta sit on a attack, you know? <laughs> Get that thorn in your flesh kind of a feeling. But here's the thing, if you choose not to say anything, and then you later down the road want to give that person the gospel, they don't feel bad about their sin and you never help them feel bad about their sin. They don't even know they're in sin. They don't know that they're in need of a savior. They're no they're not drowning. To them life is good and you the Christian have been setting that example that <clears throat> they are good. But if you're setting that example and showing Christ being the light, which brings conviction, um, <clears throat> then they're gonna they're gonna know there's a difference. So when 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 they're gonna actually bring, give an ear to you eventually, right? Maybe not at that moment, but they'll know that you're different. That you're a person that they can actually go to for answers because you know the Lord. And they're not gonna go to somebody else for issues that really matter. So the issues that matter in their lives, you know, if there's a uh, death in the family, they're going to come to you for that comfort because you're real. You're not one of those, oh, get over it. <laughs> you're, you have that heart of God. So <clears throat> it's, a, it's a serious thing to, to handle and deal with, but it's one that the more we're out of our picture, you know, out of us, the more it's all about Christ and reaching them, for the, reaching the lost, then you're going to... You're going to be that person, you know? And I'm not saying drill them and knock them out. And, you know, I did it in a loving way. And our, we're still in a good, right, good relationship with everybody at work. It's great. But what's good now, too, is they, that's what they have. They have that opportunity to come to me and talk to me. And it's not about me. It's just about living for the Lord, you know? It's just our, our decision makings really open up the door wider or they can shut it all the way. For certain people, and it's really, really hard to reach them. Mm. But uh, let's go to number three. So number, just four things we're looking at. Number three, <clears throat> it involves sin that is removed. Look at verse three. It says, "Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him.'" And to him, he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. And so they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord, or the Messiah here, stood by. 
Interesting. So Joshua in this vision seems, uh, or, or Zechariah, I should say, but um, Joshua's in the vision, but it seems uh, to be a picture of Israel's rebellion against God. Um, I don't know if you guys catch that, because here he's dressed in filthy garments, and that's, uh, that's the accusation that Satan brought to the Lord himself, against him to the Lord. Hey, Joshua's not worthy to be around your presence. He's in filthy rags. He's dirty. So and then verse 4, taking away your iniquities. Speaking of sin that's removed. He's taken away that sin, those things that he did that, that made him dirty. Why was he dirty? It's speaking of sin. Not, don't look, think physically speaking. It's a vision. You know, it's not really, you didn't go and play in the, you know, outside and all of a sudden he's in the presence of God in heaven and he's dirty. He's, it's speaking of sin here. Um, but this points also to the restoration of Israel and God brings it all back, which will happen during that millennial kingdom and <clears throat> where the Messiah is going to rule, he's going to reign for a thousand years. <clears throat> but there's... It also applies to you and I as well. So not only to Joshua, Zechariah, watching all of this, um, and then to Israel as a nation, as a whole, uh, being fulfilled, this is going to happen. But to you and I, <clears throat> what's an inter interesting picture is <clears throat> here we're, we're, we are clothed in dirty, filthy garments, right? We're speaking of our sin and our sin nature uh, prior to coming to faith in Christ Jesus, <clears throat> but the moment that we come to faith in Christ, He takes off our filthy garments, He washes us, cleanses us, and then He puts on those royal robes, right? These aren't the robes that are like you buy at the swap meet. This is like royal, right? And He puts on those royal robes, and now we're clothed in luxury. Did we deserve luxury? No. But yet he clothed you in that luxury. He gave you the best washing you can ever have. One of those washings where you just never will get dirty again kind of a thing. So that's speaking of his blood and what Christ did. <clears throat> and the turban, you guys know what the, those turbans? Um, question, what, what did it say on the front of the high priest turban? Did you guys know? Nope. Good question. Huh? In Exodus chapter 28 verse 36... Uh, it says, you shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it, like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And you shall put it on a blue cord, that it may be on the turban, and it shall be on the front of the turban. So, holiness to the Lord. I like that. Put that in the front of your car. <clears throat> but Job said, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and, I, and, and a turban, which is interesting how he throws that all together. So, cool little context here. But at, Adam and Eve, they tried putting on their own clothes and that didn't work out right, well, did it? Um, obviously, they were filthy and they were dirty. Uh, so, speaking, anything that we can do in and of ourselves and of our own efforts, it's going to be dirty and filthy. It's, we got to be clothed in His righteousness. And that's what's going to matter. Obviously, you come from a royal family from God. And so, if you're in His presence with different clothing that represents the world, it doesn't make sense, does it? Imagine uh, your pastor coming to church and he's wearing like Tupac on his shirt and he's wearing all, you know, right? That doesn't make sense. You're like scratching your head. Hey, what is this? So that's, that's kind of the picture here. If you come in the presence of God with your own clothing, it doesn't make sense. But coming in his presence with his clothing, it, it just makes sense. It's royal clothing. <clears throat> so we not only receive uh, this gift from the Lord that we can just stand in His presence, being righteous in His presence because of Him, it's an amazing thing, but also we, we serve the Lord. So we don't only just stand there and we understand, but now we're serving, and that's what I was talking to you guys about, is what the moment of salvation, 
We realized all the blessings that we have in Christ. We realized our position. We realize now our calling. We walk with the Lord. We go on, do the things that the Lord's called us. And that's where the service naturally comes in our hearts. Have you guys ever been given a gift or been served, you know, so well? Or it's just in you where you're like, I got to bless this person. I got to serve other people. And it's almost that contagious feeling where you're, you just got to do the same thing. Mm. And for me, a lot of my good works, I guess you can say, or my serving, it's because I watch others in my life that have done those things. And those are just habits because of others. I never would have just did it myself. Those are habits I saw in others that I've adopted. And it's now my life. It's now what I do. And so it's pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. So um, look at verse 6. Here's the commission here. <clears throat> then the angel of the Lord, so the Messiah, admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you, so here he's, he's clean, he's pure, but all of a sudden there, here's, a, here's, here's the if. Now you're this if, <clears throat> if you will walk in my ways, and if, you will keep my command. Then, guys, catch the if, 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 then. Here's the result. <clears throat> you shall also judge my house and likewise have charge <coughs> of my courts. Now give you places to walk among these who stand here. <clears throat> Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth <clears throat> my servant, the branch. Um, this is great. So God cleanses his people for his service. He's, he's getting Joshua. He's going to be the high priest over Jerusalem. Remember, Israel's been just desolate for about 70 years. Just nothing there. And all of a sudden, God's bringing back order. He's bringing back his temple. He's bringing back his city. <clears throat> and then there's... Um, there's his people, there's the Levites, right? The, the positions, and the very the high priest is like one of the best positions in the Old Testament. <clears throat> so here's the high priest, and, and God's saying, hey, I'm going to cleanse you for service. And with forgiveness comes responsibility. You're forgiven, that doesn't mean you can just sit there and watch TV all day now. Now it means you're, 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 you're forgiven for service. You're forgiven to get going, to get up on your feet and start being responsible for the things I've given you. And so like Joshua, we're expected to follow the Lord's commands and lead his people, right? Hey, God God said it, let's go. But there's nobody on that side. There's no food over there. There's no water in that land. There's no water. God said it, let's go. <laughs> that's, that's the idea with Joshua from the Old Testament in the book of Joshua. And all the leaders, look at Moses. You don't know where you're going most of the time. You don't know what you're doing most of the time. You don't know how you're going to you know, feed them or do all this. But God said it. That's all that matters. And to believers, we understand this. But to the world, they, don't, they need to have a list. No, 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 no. When you get there, you got to do this, this, and they need to see it. They need to write it down. How is this going to happen? Where's the toothpaste coming from? Where are we going? How are we going? Who cares? Let's go, all right? So, same thing with the Lord. God called us. He's commanding us. We know our calling. Go for it and lead his people there. That's where you got to go. Lead them closer to the word of God. There's a start. So, remember, Joshua, his name means Jehovah is salvation, which is a good thing. Now, let's look at the branch. Here's the, the last thing we want to look at. Look at verse 8 again. <clears throat> Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servants, the branch, so speaking about himself, what he would come and do. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. So even though the, the, the tree trunk of David's dynasty, um, I don't know, what's that word? Flawed, right? Fell apart. Um, out of the stump of that tree is going to emerge that little branch. 
and it's going to grow out. And, and that's the branch out of David's kingdom that was huge and then fell all apart. There was still that lineage, that, that line that God kept in reserve that the Messiah himself would come through, right? And that would be the, the, the kingdom, right, that, that would last. So uh, that's from verse 8. And then verse 9, the stone, which is just another title for Christ. In fact, um, to the church, uh, Jesus is the foundation and the chief cornerstone, according to Ephesians 2.20. Uh, to the Jews at his first coming... He was the stumbling stone, Romans 9, 32. And then to Israel at the second coming, he's the capstone, according to Zechariah 4, 7. To the Gentile powers, he's the striking stone, according to Daniel chapter 2, 34. And to, to the divine purpose, he is the, this is Daniel 2, 35, it says, he's the great mountain that will fill the whole earth. The stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So you get that idea, right? To Christ being that stone. To the unbeliever, he's the crushing stone, according to Matthew 21, 44. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. And so here we are to share the message of really of Jesus, right? By being here, being cleansed, being clothed, being commissioned. You guys catch that? Uh, all from Zechariah 3 that we just read? You kind of see that. You see the, um, from the very beginning, there's the, hey, you were forgiven, you were cleansed, you were dirty, you were unworthy. You had the, the accuser coming before, you know, the brethren, according to Revelation. Okay, you were not good, but God forgave you. God purified you. God made you who you are because of the branch. Let me remind you in the Old Testament, prophesying about Jesus, what he would do, and allowing us to even have position, right? <clears throat> then, so you're clothed, and then you're commissioned, therefore, to go. Go, therefore, into all the world, right? Present the gospel. Give him Jesus. So, um, I just encourage you guys with that is look at what Jesus has done for you. And understand, where are you? Where do you see yourself? Or do you, are you still, did you just give your life to the Lord today, you know, yesterday? Or are you in that, that, that phase where you're, you're just realizing all the blessings that you have in Christ, your position, and, and just, you know, the spiritual warfare that you're in, and understanding the, the, the weapons that you and I have? Um, or do you all know all that? Is all that like, well, that was elementary school. <laughs> God called me, and now you're in that calling, and you're doing what God's called you to do. And are you doing it faithfully? Are you, you're not just, God doesn't want bodies just to go there. Go, okay, I'm just, I'm, I just why did you come? Because God I just wanted me, I'm just here. Well, when you go, you work, you serve, you love, you bless, right? You pour out your heart until there is nothing left, which means until you die. So when you go somewhere for Christ, it's, it's everything, you're giving everything, and uh, and it doesn't stop, right? People are going to use you. Keep blessing them, because they, it, who are you blessing? You're not giving it to them. You're giving it onto the Lord, right? Because you're you're bringing back that money onto the Lord, not or whatever it is. Your reward is Christ. It's mm -hmm. not the person and what their reward is. So even if they're using you, keep giving. Do it onto the Lord, and you're always going to be blessed. If you're doing it onto them, you're going to be like, you don't deserve it. <laughs> Right? All these years and I... Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Give it to Jesus and uh, let the Lord do that work in your life. But You guys got anything to say? How many descriptions of the stone did you come up with? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven. And the nine... It says, uh, For behold, a stone that I have laid before Joshua upon this, upon a stone are seven eyes. And in the description it says, uh, nobody can really figure out what those seven eyes represent. And I was just wondering, with the seven different descriptions of what Jesus is for each nation, each type of people, Maybe that could be the seven eyes where they would look upon him 
and understand what that cornerstone, capstone, everything else was. That every nation in the world or any, all the different people yeah. can look upon them and in their own way see the stone. The stone. It's interesting. Yeah. My mind never would have gone there. <laughs> I don't know. It just, it just hit me because I was, I, I lost count, and then I was thinking about that, that seven eyes. Yeah. You know, and nobody can figure out what the seven eyes are. Yeah, I read that. You know, mm. so it's got to be mean something. You know. Maybe it just means seven. My eyes. guess is as good as any, I guess. <laughs> know certain things when we get to heaven. But it's in the word for us to know now too, yeah. so there it is. <clears throat> oh. oh they're here for my mom. They're here for your mom. Oh. She's got a light load tonight. She's not here actually. No. She canceled, so I don't know how they did it. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. Alright. Let's pray. Um, Father, thank you for your word and how you do cl clothe us. Lord, you cleanse us. You, uh, you rebuke Satan. Lord, you rebuke the enemy from our midst. And uh, we just thank you so much, Lord, that we have so much in you, that we are blessed beyond measure. And it's because of your blood. It's because of your grace, Lord, that you just continue, Lord, just to bathe us in. And uh, we just thank you, Father, that it's all about you and what you're going to do, Lord, and how you're going to do those things. And uh, may we give you the worship, Lord. May we give you the praise and the honor and the glory. Lord, anything that we can give on to you that would bring uh, a smile to your face, Lord. Help us to dance and sing and, and just lift up our voices before you, Lord, constantly. Um, and just realizing that you do the, just the same to us, Lord. You dance and sing over us because of... Just your love for us, uh, which is far greater than our love will ever be for you. And I just thank you, Lord, that you are our Father, and that you do love us, you care for us, and that you called us to go. You commissioned us, Lord, with a mission. And uh, we just pray that you would, um, Lord, continue to remind us what that mission is, and remind us your calling on our lives is uh, to present the gospel, Lord, help whatever our argument is, and uh, just... Help us to remember, Lord, to share with others around us and just point them to you. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.